So, so today we're going to talk about uh, to Google or not to Google, the ethical considerations around Googling patients. Um, as always, uh, the information shared during these does not represent the opinions of the university, unless it's expressly stated. These are my interpretations of the literature the best to the best of my ability. Our learning objectives for today, which um, because it is an ethics offering uh, course, is to define patient targeted Googling as a means of identifying collateral information, to explore some rationale and potential benefits of searching for the information about patients online, and examine some ethical considerations. So most Americans are online. We know this. 72% um, of US adults have reported using, using at least one social media platform. And to be honest, it's the uh, 65 and older group that pulls that number down from where it actually would be, um, with them being probably around the 45% of 65 and older are using that, where a much higher percentage of you know, 18 to 64 are utilizing at least one social media platform. 97% of US teens use the internet daily, um, with YouTube being the thing that is the most utilized. And you could see from the chart on the right, you know, kind of how things have changed over the years in terms of what is more utilized and less utilized. But I mean, most Americans have some sort of online presence. We know that. And that's, you know, is included, but not limited to social media. If you just Google yourself, that's always an interesting thing to do. We should probably do that every couple of years just to be sure. But for me, I did that this morning. And the first thing that comes up is the NeoMed directory. Um, after that was LinkedIn. And then a couple of things about a different Nicole Ammon, which is spelled differently. And then actually what you get to on page two is um, a govsalaries.com where it lists my Neomed salary from 2017. Um, kind of bizarre, but yeah, I guess that stuff is all within the public space. And so you could see how it'd be uh, tempting and very easy to find out information about patients. So what is patient-targeted Googling? Um, this is a term that was coined by Clinton, Silverman, and Brendel in 2010, and they used it to describe the act of searching for collateral, collateral information on patients, whether it's actually Google or not. So whether you're doing a general web search through Google or DuckDuckGo or Safari or whatever your internet browser of choice is, um, searching through court or legal records, um, searching through social media profiles, whatever the various means are, anything that would be an internet search for information about patients, and that could be with or without their knowledge. And that collateral information just being that which you obtain from other sources, where you know we often can get collateral information from patients, family members, um, from previous providers, you know, even from medical records that we're able to obtain you know, while you know, doing you know, complementary care and you know, coordinated care. So how many professionals admit to uh, engaging in patient-targeted Googling? Uh, quite a bit. It actually varies depending on which survey you look at. So some surveys in Canada showed a pretty low number. Um, a higher percentage has been shown in the US and in New Zealand. And what was interesting is that you see a difference in not only who is Googling and, and why. So out of a study that was published in 2019, they surveyed um, 114, I think it was 114. I'm losing my exact numbers off the top of my head now because I don't have my notes, but um, so they surveyed a bunch of psychiatric faculty, so the attending physicians and psychiatric residents in a New York mental health system. So in terms of the psychiatric emergency room, the vast majority of searches were done for direct patient care. So an example of something that would, could be somebody comes in um, had experiencing a psychotic episode maybe some dementia, they were brought in by police, the police didn't know who the family members were, so trying to figure out who this person is and how to contact somebody within the family. Um, it, within the private practice and outpatient settings, this was done a lot also, but the top reason cited by both attendings and residents was curiosity. And patient request, while it was noted in all settings, um, with maybe the exception of the emergency room, um, it was the least common cited reason for engaging in any kind of patient searches. So what are some possible benefits 
to searching for information about patients online. It can help us identify some discrepancies, um, might fill in the gaps between the realities of patients' life and what they share you know, when they're talking with us. It might help provide a more complete picture of the patient for a case conceptualization purpose. You know, so what are their hobbies, interests, lifestyles? Um, who are their support systems? Um, patients might even want to show you something that's kind of a source of pride. So if somebody maybe plays the piano and does a piano recital or dance recital, they might want you to look that up and see that. Um, if somebody is starting to engage in some writing and post a blog or some type of you know, short piece of fiction on the internet, they might want you to look at that also. Um, it could help you identify potential dangers and risky behavior. Um, so there's been a number of studies that show even correlationally um, the rate at which suicide and self-harm kinds of language from a particular state that's seen in Twitter also correlates pretty tightly to the use of emergency services and like crisis text line and suicide lines. Um, so you might be able to identify that somebody is engaging in um, an increase in you know, some type of risk taking, whether that's use of drugs, alcohol, gambling, um, self-harm, maybe posting some things that sound like they're thinking suicide, um, increased social isolation, um, even something that could be abusive or manipulative from a partner. So you can get a much better sense of what's going on with the person. In Baker, George, and Kaufman uh, note a list of scenarios where patient-targeted Googling might be justified. So if you feel like there is a concern where you need to let somebody know what's going on, um, where you know, if we have an issue about a duty to warn, if you're trying to figure out if they're doctor shopping, so you know, is a patient going around trying to achieve a particular aim and you know, isn't getting what they need, whatever need they want met from a particular physician, so is then going around and you know, trying to do that. Um, if you're getting evasive responses from logical questions, so you just kind of want to check what's going on. Um, claims in the patient's history that seem improbable. And there was a couple of clinical scenarios that were pointed to in some of the literature um, that were kind of complex and about a patient who was seeking a mastectomy um, and reporting cancer, but the whole history seemed very bizarre. And you know, that eventually they found a bunch of information online that collaterally made it, it all very questionable. Um, discrepancies between what you see in the clinical record and what they report something of clinical urgency. Um, if you receive some kind of discrediting information or something from another health professional, incongruency between what you hear from the patient or the family, and then you know suspicion of any kind of physical abuse, um, substance misuse, and concerns of suicide risk. So all of these, according to them, are things that might justify. So here's a quick case scenario on the you know, maybe it justifies it, maybe it doesn't. And we can talk about it a little now or we could talk about it at the end. But Dr. X treats a patient for bipolar disorder. The patient's recently hospitalized for mania and psychosis. At the hospital, they're started on an antipsychotic and some stabilizing medications, referred to the doctor for follow-up. The patient comes in, is really eager to say, hey, I'm doing so great, I'm a thousand times better. I've realized I'm on a journey of recovery. And so I started a blog. I'm gonna record all my ups and downs. And I already have a bunch of followers on Twitter. So the patient leaves and the doctor starts to wonder if she should take a look at the patient's blog. On one hand, might help her to get to know him a little bit better, kind of also monitor the ups and downs. On the other hand, would it be crossing a boundary into, you know, is this crossing a professional boundary? Is, you know, what are the implications of following this patient online with their blog? So some potential risks. Um, breakdown of that professional trust and relationship. You know, are we crossing a boundary violation? Are we potentially diving into an area of privacy and um, autonomy that would not be appropriate in any other setting? What we find online might create bias. It could change our perception of the patient. Um, it would change the perception of the family and the support system of the patient. It might even then influence our clinical decisions and what treatment we're offering or suggesting, which we know in, you know, it, implicit bias absolutely can. We have to consider the fact that information online might be inaccurate. Um, it could be incomplete and it might fully lack context. The other thing to consider is sometimes people have kind of an online persona that is not necessarily fully in line with who they are in life. And there's lots of reasons that people do this and whether or not we fully agree with or understand them, it's something that we know exists within the online space. And you know, this could clearly be some type of a boundary violation. 
So case scenario two, it's kind of easy to see where the boundary violation and um, potential bias comes in. You have a patient who's accruing a large bill after negotiating a reduced fee. The provider, kind of feeling a little bit skeptical, decides to find, you know, pull up the patient's address from the chart, do a Google map search, sees that the patient is living in a large mansion according to their address. Provider then decides to search the property value of the place that the person is living, feels angry and that the patient has misrepresented their financial situation and confronts the patient. To which the patient then says, well, I've been renting a small basement room for a nominal fee and part of what I also have to do to rent there is I have to do the yard work. So patient's pretty offended, does not come back. And when we think about possible boundary violations, I mean, if pre-internet or absent of internet, nobody would ever think about driving past a patient, like pulling up the address and driving past a patient's home to see where do they actually live. Um, that would be weird. And we'd all pretty easily be like, yeah, that's not okay. We're not going to do that, let alone go search into property records or previous sales records to see what the appraised property value is. So pretty, pretty clear to see that that would be a boundary violation and why it could harm that, you know, that therapeutic relationship. So big ethical considerations. Um, informed consent. If we are going to engage in some type of patient-targeted Googling, are we telling the patient about it? Are they aware that we're going to do that? Are they agreeable about it? Is there a good rationale to do so? Um, if we do choose to engage in this and we find information, are we documenting it? Where are we documenting it? How are we documenting it? What is there to document? Um, if you do some kind of search without the patient knowing in advance, but you find something and now you feel like this is important to talk about and actually you know, have a conversation with the patient about, are you going to disclose it? Or are you going to hold on to this information and do something with it without ever telling the patient that, it, that you know things? Um, what you find, is it even relevant to what's going on clinically and to why you are working with that individual patient? Um, is this something that you're doing because you think that there is a major risk or is it strictly being voyeuristic and curious? And obviously if there is, is an imminent risk, there could be a lot of you know, A, legitimacy to doing this, but then you have to think about, well, what are we going to do next? So the folks that coined the term patient-targeted Googling, Clinton Silverman and Brindell did propose that because there's not a lot of guidance out there on how to do this or how not to do this, or if we should or shouldn't, they propose that we reflect on the following questions. You know, so why do I wanna conduct the search? Um, is this clinically relevant? Am I curious? Am I worried? Do I need to get a better sense of what's going on with this person because they're not sharing a whole bunch? And so just really considering why, and if there's any kind of personal intrinsic motivation that has to do with the clinician, then they need to really take a step back and maybe consult with colleagues. Uh, would this search advance treatment or would it potentially compromise treatment? Is this going to change what treatment I'm offering somebody for better or worse? Should I obtain informed consent from the patient prior to doing this? Some patients, this is going to be a real clear and straightforward, and they might even want you to. Um, and sometimes you might want to, but you know the patient is not going to be okay with that, but it still feels like it's clinically relevant and maybe important to. Should I share the results? Um, what's going to be the implications? How will the patient respond if I share the results? Should I be documenting the findings and where and how? Because as we know, the medical record, well, is very important for somebody to be able to step in and share kind of this larger clinical picture. Medical records are also largely set up for billing purposes and insurance company purposes. So you know, how much are we ever sharing in the medical record or not? And really, how do I monitor my own motivations and the ongoing risk benefit profile? So really taking in a very thoughtful consideration before engaging in any type of online search. So is it ethical or unethical? Um, the American Psychiatric Association says that patient targeted Googling is not inherently unethical, so long as it's done within the, you know, the patient's best interest. Um, it, in and of itself, it's neither ethical nor unethical but we need to consider, you know, are we promoting patient care and well-being primarily? Um, so long as we're not doing this out of curiosity, our own internal motivations, it might be a completely fine thing to do, but we need to be very cautious to consider all of the factors before making the decision to engage in any kind of collateral, you know, search for collateral information online or otherwise. 
So there's uh, some of my resources and I can open it up for questions. <laughs> 